Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Welcome this morning to Reverend Phineas Finn Washer. Pastor Finn and his wife Sylvia live in Houston. They have grown children in Spring, Conroe, and Danbury, Connecticut. Mr. Washer received his theological training at Austin Seminary in Austin, Texas. Thank you to our guest artists, Shivangi Kunchan and Ashley Jones. In gratitude and devotion, we give of our time, talents, and financial gifts. Let us worship with joy through our offerings. Amen. Pay attention, applaud God, bring a gift of laughter, sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. He made us, we did not make him. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank God, worship the Holy One for our eternal savior is sheer beauty. All generous in love, loyal always and ever, amen.
Let us pray. In a world in which there is so much confusion, so much clamor, so many voices bidding for our attention, give us discerning spirits and thoughtful minds. This that we might not miss your voice or discount your efforts to touch our lives and claim our attention. If we have been focused on lesser gods, thinking only of ourselves, acquiring goods and money, personal advancement, never mind the needs of others, or of making a name for ourselves, forgive our sin. Restore within us a right spirit and allow your love to shine brightly in all that we say and in all that we do. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Finn Washer, and I had this morning a time prepared for the young disciples. So any young disciples that are out there, I invite you to come close to the television, pay attention. I want to tell you about one of the delightful things of my growing up years was a pet, a sandy colored cocker spaniel who was a delight to play with that my sister and I named Sandy. Now Sandy understood a few words. Sandy knew her name because if anybody called her name, her ears would perk up and she would yank her head around to see who was calling. Sandy knew the words, let's go, because always following those words, our family would pile into the car and we would run errands, and Sandy loved to be a part of that excitement. And when someone said, let's go, she would jump to her feet and run to the door. And Sandy knew too what we meant when we said, outside, Sandy, outside. Now, those were probably all the words that Sandy knew, but Sandy knew that we loved her. And when we spoke in a gentle, soft way, with kind of, you're the best dog in the world, you could see that she was really warming to what we were saying and knew she was being appreciated. On the other hand, if she had been a bad dog and we were speaking in a stern, harsh voice, you're just not a good dog, Sandy. Sandy picked that up too. And Sandy learned to communicate with us. If she were hungry, she would go over to her dog bowl close to the refrigerator and shoved and move and make a ruckus and the hungrier she was, the more she would do that. Now, for some reason, we cannot see God and we cannot hear God speak, but God has a way of getting across to us, of letting us know what God wants and what we should do and how much God loves us. And we have ways of letting God know that we love him also. Going to church is one of those ways, which I hope we'll be able to do soon. So though we cannot see God and cannot hear God's words, we can be in touch with God and God with us. God bless you very much.
Let us pray. O oh God, through the hearing of your word, grant us faith to hear and understand what you want us to learn. Hear us as we strive to live in the footsteps of Christ. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes to us from Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 10, and 14. Listen for the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Good morning, my name is Phineas Washer. I'm a retired Presbyterian minister, and I'm very honored this morning to be speaking to and in behalf of the congregation of the First Presbyterian Church in Huntsville. The scripture reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 12 and verse one. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, go from your country and from your kindred. Let us bow in prayer. Lord, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Among the most puzzling phrases in Scripture are these two words, God said, God said to Abraham, go from your country and from your kindred. And God said to Noah, build an ark. The phrase God said, which you find scattered throughout the scriptures, uh, suggests that the people of God heard the Lord speaking with a crystal clear, no question about it message. So unmistakable as if I might say to you, good morning, or would you please put the book on the shelf? Unfortunately, God's voice is not always that clear to us in these times. At one time or another, we have probably all found ourselves in a valley of decision, stymied by two possible options that uh, are both clouded and uh, puzzling uh, to choose from. Maybe you have been accepted by two colleges, both appeal to you, but the question is, which is the best place for you? Or before you are two job offers equally attractive and you wonder, which is the right one for me? The time has come to buy a new house. Two possibilities present themselves, each as inviting as the other and you know, have no clue as to which to choose. Why won't the God of Abraham, who apparently made everything so clear to his friend from the era of Chaldees, speak to me like that, leaving no room for uncertainty? Life would go so much smoother if I could uh, advance with the knowledge that I was doing the right thing and making the correct choice. But that apparently is not how God comes to us these days, and who really expects such under, uh, unmistakable divine direction anybody? Say a neighbor approaches you and says something like this, I've just got to tell you that God talked to me last night. 
well, your response would probably fall somewhere between a low-grade disbelief, uh-huh, sure, sure, and an outright certainty that this person should be hauled off to the funny farm on the next truck headed that way. Because these days, so it seems, God doesn't get in touch with us with absolute clarity to which the phrase, God spoke to me, would seem to apply. And even for those spiritual giants of Bible times, was the message of heaven really all that clear to them? Take, for instance, one item in the conversation which God and Abraham had going between them. The Lord was very clear and straightforward. Abraham, I want you to leave your country and your kindred. Leave your kindred. But Abraham's obedience here was squishy. He took along his young nephew, ne uh, Lot, who was a troublemaker and caused one headache after another. Abraham had many reasons to rue the day he ever took Lot along with him and did not leave him behind as God had instructed. But if the phrase God says is a bit puzzling and hardly fits the experience of people of faith having the eternal one in our time, how does get God get across to us, especially in those matters in which we so deep, desperately need a well-defined, don't leave me in the dark, word of guidance? Jesus spoke about those who could predict the weather, not because they looked at the heavens, but because they discerned what was there, the cloud formations, the change of color. To one with some perception, it was clear which way the weather would be going. And so it may be with God's word to us that it takes more than just listening for a word, but some discernment. And a better rendering of the phrase, God said, it seems to me might for our day be, God communicated. We all know that there are all sorts of ways to communicate with people. For one thing, communication does not require words. People communicate when they look at their watch when they frown, when they smile, when they smirk, when they wink, a forced laugh, loud applause, all of these convey meaning from one mind to another. You ever hear anyone talk about grandma? Grandma had a way of letting you know what was in her mind without saying a word to you, a raised eyebrow, and that particular stare let you know for sure that you were headed in the wrong direction and Grandma had not said a word to you. How does this communication business work? Well, a possible answer comes from the devotional writer F.B. Meyer. Meyer lived at a time when the captains of ships to enter the right dock, the right harbor, had to find three lights associated with the harbor and steer until those lights were aligned up. Meyer said, this is a clue to knowing what God wants us to do to the harbor in which we should be headed. The first clue, he said, was one of inner feelings. What is going on within us? What is our reasoning tell us? Our assessment of situations, the feelings we have, where are they headed? And are we headed in that direction? The second lie had to do with circumstances. 
In what direction were the things outside of us pointing? That which was ahead and that which was behind and those matters to the side. And then F.B. Meyer claimed there was a third light that needed to be lined up with the inner feelings, with the outward circumstances, and that was the voice of Scripture. Now, most people probably um, hesitate to see themselves as the master of a book with a thousand plus pages, but we don't have to master the Bible to get guidance from it. Perhaps the story of scriptures from Sunday school as a child or in a recent sermon from a pastor we admire and who preaches helpfully. All of these, we may, in, in such instances, we may have a truth that burrows deep into our consciousness that gives us direction for an issue that we are dealing with. Well, according to F.B. Maher, if we found the promptings within us matching the circumstances without, all pointing in the same direction, if those three lights, one of them being scripture, pretty clearly were heading in the same direction, we were probably hearing a word for ourselves this is the way, walk ye in it. One of the most significant decisions a pastor makes has to do with moving from one location to another, a decision in which a minister or anyone makes under that circumstances, you would want as much certainty as possible. After serving in Beaumont for seven years, I sensed that the time perhaps had come to move on. Shortly into the summer, I entered into conversation and met informally with the search committee of John Knox Presbyterian Church on the west side of Houston. An informal visit thereafter, I felt a kindred spirit with that committee, and I think the feeling was mutual. The light of the inner nudge had flipped on in what seemed to be a pretty strong amen within me that I, a new association with those folks and they with me was a strong possibility. But what about the guiding light of circumstances Three matters were in play. Two of them had to do with myself and my wife, Sylvia. They were of no great consequence except as signs that came along, which I will discuss in a moment. The third matter was far more serious, the best time to move for our children and their school schedule. As for me, I had always wanted a nice lawnmower. A fancy fantasy that I entertained was having one of the best, best mowers available, but I consistently yielded to the reality of family finances and never bought anything more than a Kmart special. Sylvia, my wife had a very special hymn that she loved. I danced in the morning. But the church where we were was offended by that hymn, and so it was not worth the trouble of pushing it. So much for lesser matters. The issue that was critically important to us was the school schedule. Our daughter, Sarah, who had just completed the middle school, would be attending high school come the fall. We realized that moving this, that summer would make a transition for Sarah much easier than had we stayed in Beaumont and pulled her out after school had started. The deadline we felt to do this would be August the 9th, given the matters related to the school she was attending. 
The search committee invited our family to visit John Knox the last weekend of July for a final evaluation as to whether God was calling our family and that congregation to be a match set. On the Saturday morning of our visit, one of the members of the committee took us to the manse, unlocked the garage door through which we were entering the house, yanked up the door, and there right in the middle of the garage was a spanking brand new red Jacobson lawnmower among the most highly rated brands of its time. On Sunday morning, we visited the worship service. At the conclusion of the service, we all rose to sing a hymn. And the hymn was, I danced in the morning. Sylvia and I gave each other a knowing look of amazement. We returned to Beaumont that afternoon, excited and ready to say yes if invited but trying to keep our feet on the ground and realizing that the whole business was out in the hands of the search committee and in the hands of one who knows our going out and our coming in. And still very aware that if this were to work for our family, it had to be completed before the next weekend was out. August the 8th, the, the day before the deadline we had set for ourselves was a Sunday. We had heard nothing from the committee through the afternoon and into the evening. About 9.45 that evening, I flipped on the TV for us to watch the news that would shortly be broadcast. And about the same time, the phone rang. It was the search committee from John Knox wanting to know if we would accept an invitation and come and be their pastor. God had spoken to our family. The light of circumstances which was happening all around us now matched our inner sense of rightness about the matter. And if we needed a scripture, would one do better than what God said to Abraham? Go from your country. I know of no better way to explain that entire experience other than with this phrase, God had spoken to us, and yet we never heard words never saw a burning bush, never witnessed the heavens opening. But if we had, could they have made God's direction for our lives any clearer? God may not have spoken us to us in a deep bass voice, sounding like it was coming from a loudspeaker 20 feet above our head but God had communicated to us at a critical fork in the road in our inner sense of what was right for us in the circumstances that so clearly spoke to us and as best we could tell in scripture. God had spoken, we felt, as clearly as God must have communicated with Abraham and we were sure of our direction. Thanks be to God.
convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to ask that uh, wherever we are, or probably most of you in your living room, that we bow together and have morning prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, creator and overseer of all that is, keeper of your flock and savior of your people, what unfathomable mysteries have engulfed us these days? A health crisis that has stymied the finest minds of our time and unleashed immeasurable suffering and taken out all too many of those most precious and dear to us. The elderly, a disproportionate number of uh, minorities, medical people pouring their hearts into their work to heal and to save, others in their prime too young to lose and too needed here on earth. We pray this morning for all suffering, all dying, too many alone, unattended by those dearest and most precious to them. May angels stand close and comfort, be ministering to them through channels of grace, which you alone can give. We pray for those doing research, searching for a cure to this horrible epidemic, for those in studies and in labs and on teams and with companies that are probing for solutions, attempting to develop vaccines, for all those giving themselves to an exploration of remedies that their hands may be strengthened, their minds engaged by sources of truth and wisdom that come from the source of all that is good. We pray for doctors and nurses, lab technicians and all who support them, that they may be strengthened in their tasks that are designed to exhaust them and that they may be fortified physically mentally and spiritually in their good work. We pray for our civic leaders who are making and must make life and death decisions that like your servant Solomon of another time, they may be granted an intelligence beyond themselves and find beneficial solutions where there appear to be none now. And those who have kept and do keep our society running, people responsible for getting food from the farm to the family, delivery people, postal employees, restaurant owners and managers, diligent workers in grocery stores, and a host of others. O oh Lord, hasten the end of this plague. Keep your people safe. Give us wisdom and patience and common sense in abundance that we may weather the storm, hold fast the best within us, and serve you by serving those around us. We pray as we have been taught, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and Amen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth. Dance, dance, wherever you may 
Lift up your eyes to see where God sends you. Let your worship continue as you serve. Follow Christ, who calls us as disciples. Follow Christ to minister to all who need healing. And know that the God of truth and grace will be with you. Amen. <laughs> 